uh, the founder of Niagara Podcasters Network, which is a network of um, locally focused podcasts in the Niagara region and uh, the, the heart of Canada's hospitality uh, industry, I, I like to say. And um, we wanted to build an organization that uh, focused on building storytelling capacity uh, because we felt that as more and more um, ownership is concentrated uh, amongst a few very large businesses, um, we started to feel that there was a very um, pressing sense that our local capacity to tell stories could be diminished really at any point. And time and again, we've been proven right on that. It's layoffs after layoff after layoff um, in, uh, in big business media. And so we set up this organization to basically focus on telling local stories um, so that uh, if that capacity ever disappeared entirely, that there would still be somebody doing it. So that's why, that's what we're doing at Niagara Podcasters Network. Um, setting that up was uh, way, uh, way more work than I ever thought it was going to be. Um, if, if I knew uh, then what I know now, it may not have ever started. But one of the biggest challenges that we had when we, uh, when we set up was that there were lots of people who wanted to tell their stories, but they didn't have a lot of experience in trying to do that. And so we needed to develop some, uh, some ways of, uh, of making that happen. And it's one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today, is one of the frameworks that we used in order to, uh, to do that. So let's see. Um, a little bit, uh, actually let me zoom that up so that you can uh, see it. So the problem that we were trying to solve is that we had a lot of shows in production. We currently have 12 shows. Uh, in production, there are more than 30 volunteers who are involved in various elements of that production. So whether they're hosts, uh, producers, audio engineers, recording engineers, editors, um, researchers, all those uh, people basically say, I would like to do this one little small part of participating in the podcast. And um, me and a couple others have to uh, basically do all the coordinating to make sure that actually turns out into an episode at the, uh, at the end of it. And there's lots of ways that it can go wrong. But one of the first ways that it can go wrong is um, you have this idea that you want to do for an episode, but you don't know actually how to turn it into an episode. And we had a lot of that um, up front. People who were passionate about their subject areas, but when it came time to actually putting the episode together, we weren't certain how to structure it. And so, I did what anyone else would do. I Googled, you know, how to how to do this stuff. And I I have a little bit of a, uh, I went to school for journalism, but I spent 20 years writing code for a living. So um, that uh, it definitely was not my um, uh, these skills weren't muscle memory for me at the time. And so I started listening to a lot of different kinds of podcasts, and I started listening to um, to, to people who were talking about you know. Uh, writing and how to, how to structure writing and how to uh, starting to, to synthesize all these things together. And we came up with um, uh, an approach that satisfied a couple of really specific needs. Um, we needed a common way to uh, basically starting point to teach all of our hosts and all of our producers and all of our audio engineers a common language for describing how we're going to approach episodes. Um, and so that was the uh, that was the first part of it. We needed it to be adaptable because uh, there's lots of different formats within that. Um, for uh, across the network, we have interview shows, we have host co-host sort of you know banters, we have um, we have a um, uh, more like a panel sort of discussion uh, around uh, local news and current events. Um, so we needed something that worked across. Uh, all of those formats as well. Um, and we needed it to be simple to teach. These are people who are volunteers. They're not doing this on a full-time basis. They're not 
um, they're not interested in the, the same uh, level of um, uh, skill or expertise as somebody who is doing it professionally. Um, and by no means do we strive to be a replacement for those people who are teaching or doing this um, professionally. Um, but we wanted uh, we wanted something that was uh, that we could take and then give show people that it was uh, that it was reproducible. Um, and after a bunch of iterations, we came up with uh, with basically this uh, this idea called the Big Idea Framework. And at its uh, at its essence, it's really uh, this: you pick a topic. And what is the single most important thought, idea, feeling, or lesson that you want to impart to your audience as a result of having listened to your episode? So that part's really important because you have a, you have a finite amount of time, right? You have anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and a half uh, to, to like really get that, uh, that point across. But if you're covering a bunch of things, then that means you have to take whatever time you have and divide it up amongst those things. If you focus on one thing, you can, you can change people's minds, you can teach them something new, you can inspire them about something if you focus on that one thing at a time. And that was something that we learned after OG work. We're into our, we're approaching 900 episodes across the network now. So, um, so this is a lot of iteration. Um, the, uh, once you have that point, um, sorry, I missed a point. One of the things you need before you do this is you need an understanding of who your audience is. Um, how many people have used the idea of a, uh, an audience persona to help identify who it is they're speaking to in their uh, podcast? Mr. Howie, nice to meet you. You too. Um, so we've got uh, uh, we've got uh, Mike there, who I just met in person for the first time. That's pretty cool. Uh, who else? Anyone? Okay. Um, so uh, a few people. The idea of persona is uh, uh, often used in either uh, software or marketing, but it's really it is a person representative of the, the type of people you want to listen to your show, and you. You provide as many descriptive details as you can about that person without getting you know, specific enough where you're sort of you know, pointing out um, you know, one person. The better a job you can do with this, ultimately, the more you can identify who it is that you want to be listening to your uh, show, the more people you're going to connect and as you start building content along uh, with that purpose, the more you are going to find those moments in your show where the audience connects with you and says, oh my god, me too. Oh yeah, that's happened to me too. I totally get where you're coming from. <laughs> you don't want them to say me too. Well, <laughs> I, need to, I need to revise this out, but yeah, I know, I know exactly what you mean. Um, uh, but uh, you want them to connect emotionally with, uh, with what you're saying, without saying me too. Um, but the more of those kinds of moments that you can create through the conversations that you're having, um, the, uh, the more deeply connected you will be with your audience. And when it comes to the people that we're uh, talking with at Niagara Podcasters, we don't care if we have a huge audience, we're not going for a global audience, we're going for people in Niagara. So we want to build content that connects with those people in Niagara. And we have specific people in mind, and when we're when we're framing the, uh, our episodes, we're thinking of those people while we're doing it. So, you have that person in your mind um, who you want to speak to. Each episode, you take what's the most important thing that you want them to think about, to feel, to learn that one thing, and you um, you start to build your episode around that. If you can articulate that in one sentence, that's ideal. But if it takes a couple of, to get the thought through, that's what's more important is that you you get it out rather than um, the thing. So once you do that, um, we suggest starting with three supporting points. So that could be, um, again, if you're, uh, let's say you're doing an interview show um, and 
you are interviewing an actor, and that actor has become really well known for um, for a certain kind of role or some you know specific movies, and you want you want your audience to um, connect with the actor on that experience, how they went from this nobody to um, to getting these you know crazy awesome roles. So your three supporting points would, might be talking about uh, specific movies. Uh, if you're talking about, say, an environmental issue, uh, say, uh, one of the things that's come up is there is a, uh, there's a property development in Niagara Falls that they're trying to build on um, some protected wetlands. And there's a whole bunch of conversations around how that's a, a bad thing. And we might decide that one of our uh, news uh, podcasts is going to focus on that story. And the thing, the big idea out of that story is we want people to understand why it's bad, why we shouldn't be building that. Um, and so our three supporting points, uh, you know, one might be environmental, you know, one might be from a uh, planning and zoning uh, standpoint, and one might be actually talking about the, uh, the ecology, because there's actually a couple of uh, distinct species of animals whose um, habitat would be destroyed if development were to, to go through there. So, um, so we uh, you, you build your supporting points, and then you flesh out those story points with personal stories, examples, articles, um, research, interviews. Right. This is where you get into the uh, into the, the meat of things. Right. If you can. If you can tell a personal story that connects with a couple of these supporting points, then that's where you're building that connection with your audience. And the more, the more you have your, uh, the, the more detail you have in your persona, the more likely you are to understand um, how uh, how to connect with that person in a way that will uh, persuade them. And this is ultimately. Uh, that's what. Uh, that's ultimately why we do the work that we're doing. Is we're trying to inform, educate, persuade, um, and uh, yeah. So that's the like that's the, the format in uh, uh, in a nutshell. Actually, this went way faster than I thought it was going to. Um, we have, uh, like I said, we we have twelve shows in production right now. We are uh, run, we're basically in pre-production on another uh, seven shows. Um, our goal was to have 20 shows in production by the time I sat up here again, and well, you know, we didn't quite get there. But we have we have 12 really good shows, and I'm I'm proud of those. And you know, some things sometimes things don't go the way you think they're going to go. But um, a large part of being able to put those shows together and start to teach people to hand off that work so that they can run with it on their own was in um, uh, developing a framework. What I was hoping you guys would want to do uh, today is if uh, uh, it looks like most folks have like notepads or laptops or things to um, uh, to, to basically do some some stuff on. I would love to see you guys uh, apply this to an upcoming episode of a, a show that you've got, and even if you just spend five ten minutes uh, doing that and uh, starting to share the results, basically what you see at, from using this to um, to how you were approaching it before, if there's any differences, or if you guys do something in a different way. Um, yeah, this went way faster than I thought, so um, I am open for questions. You guys can spend some, some time trying it out, see what you think, and uh, we can turn it into a little bit of a workshop as well. Yes, you uh -huh. question. So, so I've got a magazine style podcast yep. where every, everything on there is related to personal development or self-improvement, but there's different segments. So there'll be like a long interview with an author, and then I've got some regular contributors, so shorter interviews with them, and sometimes there's an essay or another piece attached. Mm -hmm. So the theme, so there's no kind of one big question, except, so would you say that I should approach each segment with that, or do you think I should be thinking of each podcast and making sure each episode and making sure that every segment is connected? I think you could do both. I think you could use this format with each segment within your magazine, and you might need um, you might need less detail in each of the segments because they're uh, they're smaller. Um, but you could still, uh, as far as the segment goes, 
at the very least, like the most important thing you want people to take away from that segment still applies, and maybe one or two supporting points instead. And the, the personal stories, examples and stuff, those are often, like those are your, um, those are your citations or your voice clips or stuff like that. You just, you want to get that, uh, that personal or direct angle into uh, to whatever it is that you're covering so that people understand um, why it has a connection to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then, there, uh, does your magazine, do you have any themes that you carry through from episode episode in the magazine? Or is it just, this is what's going on this week? Uh, well, so, so it's, uh, or, I mean, it's like a podcast, so it's a yeah. magazine style podcast, right? Um, but, no, I mean, the theme is it's all around personal development and self-improvement, but that can be everything from, uh, from fitness to relationships to, you know, every, everything in there. And within, within the magazine, you don't take any time, you don't um, say, uh, this episode we're focusing on uh, fitness, as an example. I haven't so far, no. Yeah. Like, so, I, I mean, in terms of the marketing that, you, that I do for each episode, it's mm -hmm. all focused on the main interview. Right. So if I'm interviewing someone who wrote a book about fear, then all the marketing will be about what to do with our fears. Yeah. And so then, then it might also be something after that that's where I where I got a, an interview with our nutrition contributor yeah. about diets or something. Yeah. Um, in in those cases, I, I'd see you could probably follow this for the main like the main segment uh, fairly in a fairly straightforward parallel way, and then the um, uh, supplementary segments you could uh, you could use this in. Um, uh, like in a modified form. That's the other thing. We're not prescribing the one true way of telling podcasting stories here. This is this is like this is something that's worked for us, and it helped us get a lot of people with not a lot of experience off the ground uh, really quickly. And I guess the other thing that's important to say is that people who have been using this, they've they're taking it and they're um, they're modifying it. They're doing other things. Like our our most popular uh, uh, podcast is called. Uh, Practical Feminist, and um, they uh, uh, they very loosely follow this approach, but they have their own distinct way of um, uh, of doing things. And uh, but when we when we teach new people, we say this is where you can start, and then pick and choose how it uh, how it works with you. And people just they they take this, they internalize it, and then they make it their own. So that's that's what I'm prescribing. You guys can can do as well. This is. We're, we're not saying this is the uh, you know the, the, the way to this is not the way to podcast. I guess you get that later in the day with uh, um, with you. Um, you the how to podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, how I have a question. How does this um, idea or framework apply to like more banter uh, focused podcasts? Because those tend to be the ones I'm on. Uh, when we saw the news. You don't say. Yeah, they just sort of shoot the shit and try yeah. to make each other laugh. <laughs> how how do you how could we maybe apply this framework to to something like that where it's it's oh so a show. well in a in a lot of those shows you're you're usually focusing on one or two like things that are happening within that topic space right right so and then you're you're basically having conversations around that thing so um, you. Uh, your, your big idea in that case is, you know, what you're coming to have that conversation around. Um, you're, but each of you might come with three supporting points that support your particular point of view. Um, and uh, your personal stories might be in it, like a personal anecdote. It might be, you know, to illustrate what I'm talking about, I found this, you know, this uh, article, you know, we're putting a link to it in the show notes, but this is what it says, right? Um, stuff like that, or if it's a more serious topic, you know, you might, um, uh, you know, you might rely on some, you know, actual research and, and stuff like that. So, um, but then you're still having the, the the banter back and forth. It doesn't change the um, the approach to the conversation, but you'll find that if you if you use this um, approach in prepping for the uh, for the chat. Then your conversations are going to be able to go a lot more, uh, a lot deeper, because you all have like your your prep done, right? So you can get into a lot more of the nuances of the conversation. And those are the like those are the places in any conversation where people discover those those 
moments of, of connection where they're like, oh yeah, no, that's, uh, that's happened to me, I get that. Um, and, uh, and that's when you connect with them, and that's when they keep coming back. So, yes, uh, and then you, and then you. <laughs> sure, I was just, I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on, um, if, you, if you're tackling a more complex uh, topic, like, for example, um, a, new, a new development in the Niagara region that's going to affect uh, a lot of the local uh, environment, and you have these complex topics, do you, like, do you have them listed out as bullet points? Because when you're talking about important things that you want your audience to know, feel, and understand, like, have you found it helpful to really kind of list them out so that even if you're in a banter style show, as the hosts, you can kind of just keep going back to those topics and make sure that you kind of cover them throughout the conversation? Oh, yeah. So, uh, a, a one of the outputs um, of this, so let me, let me show you the, the next part. So we do uh, regular editorial meetings with, uh, with each show where um, we use Trello to organize our shows. How many people use Trello for show organization? It's like use it with them. So it is, uh, it's really the only way we can keep this many uh, moving parts uh, organized. I'll, I'll show you what, uh, uh, what we do. Um, further down here, uh, if you guys want to take a look at um, this link, um, big idea hyphen PCTO18 um, on Bitly. Uh, I think we'll have an opportunity to post links and stuff on each uh, session when we're done. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'll make sure this gets up there. But this is a this is a link to a card on Trello that is like a, a template card for. Um, for the big idea format, and so if we click through, um, actually, hold on, uh, the uh, Wi Fi is pretty funny, so I will put it there. So um, this basically lays it out, and so when we do our editorial meetings, we already have one or more cards like this that are that represent each episode that we want to do, and uh, we talk about uh, we talk about the what we want to accomplish with those episodes in broad strokes, and we sort of figure out when we're going to record them. The purpose of the editorial meeting is to figure out what we're uh, what we're going to record in our upcoming recording session. So, uh, so to answer uh, your question, when uh, when we're fleshing these out. This is where the this is where the bullet points come in, and absolutely we uh, we follow that. Now some hosts do this better than others, right? So um, the more organized that you are, I think the better you can lead those kinds of conversations generally. Um, and and but then there's some people on our network where they just they're looking for the soapbox, and they you know it's that's also fine, right? But um, I, I think that if you really want to persuade people. Uh, you know, or inform them, or educate them. Then you need to put you need to put the work in, right? So, uh, and this uh, this is a starting point for uh, for doing that. Um, and then we have uh, each show gets like a two hour recording slot every two weeks, roughly, um, and we can fit anywhere from uh, one to uh, five of these in a recording session. And so that's those are the shows that we record um, in that segment, and then we do it again in, uh, in two weeks. And that's basically how our uh, process goes. So, yes, now. One thing I find like daunting and confusing, even when I talk to another person, maybe not even a, a show or something, but when you have your main idea mm -hmm. um, that you want to communicate, how early do you reveal it? For example, if I have a headline like, my dog is my best friend or something, someone might be like, I don't believe that. That sounds very outlandish. Or, Jumping jacks are the best exercise ever, right? And it's all like, yeah. True fact. <laughs> so, but, but by the end of the show, I might convince them. So, but if I say it too early, so there's like a conflict between like, if I say it too early, they might be turned off, but they need to know what the episode is about. So I gotta mm -hmm. mention something. If I say it too early, I'm not convincing them enough. If I say it too late, they don't know what the show is about. Yeah. But how do you resolve that? that that is, so that's a that's a really good question. I I would say first and foremost, this does not prescribe an answer to that question in any way. But I if I were 
um, when I'm doing this, um, I would, uh, if I wanted to say jumping jacks were the best exercise ever, I would start off by, um, by saying, you know, I've tried lots of different exercises. I've done push-ups, and those are for suckers. I've done, you know, uh, sit-ups, and uh, you know, clearly, right? Um, and uh, you know, they just they didn't get the results that that I wanted. But you know, and I'd lead into that, and I'd say, what do other people? Uh, I would probably find other people who you know are talking about other different types of exercises. And over time, I would. Um, uh, you know, I would lead uh, up to that. But yeah, I don't think I would necessarily um, go in saying that they're uh, that they're the best for the reasons that uh, you described. I don't know that I would. I don't know that it would take the entire uh, episode, though. I'm thinking like a 22, 24 minute uh, episode. By the way, that's our sort of average episode time because that's the average commute time in the Niagara region. So um, we break it down in chunks like that. Yeah. Um, so do you find most people are listening during in, in the car? Is that the when based on the feedback that we've gotten so far? Yeah, it's uh, it's in the car, on the bus, that sort of thing. Um, and um, uh, the other the other major uh, use case is uh, when people are like after dinner doing the dishes, stuff like that. They they throw them on. Uh, they just put you know earbuds in and you know take care of the. The kitchen doing that. Actually, most of my friends who listen listen that way. So, because they don't want to spend time doing it any other way. <laughs> so, yeah. To to get back to the when to to do it, I think if um, I think it really depends on your audience. Like, what I what I would say is. Tell me a little bit more about your audience, and um, are they already are they already exercise uh, aficionados, right? Do they do they already have a a one true way to, to exercise? Because if they do, they're much less likely to be persuaded by your argument than you know someone else. If it's somebody just approaching, if your persona is somebody just approaching exercise for the first time, they're going to be much more open to hearing that that's the the one true way to. To exercises through jumping jacks, right? So it's it's a really really audience dependent um, question. And let's just change the topic. Okay, not the topics, not jumping jacks are, but what is the most? Then you pique curiosity, and you're able to go through the same points mm -hmm. and the same stories. You know, so don't yeah. put them on a on a position at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, my question is more about your network. You, you said in the beginning that you were uh, looking to be storytellers in a place where the corporate media was diminishing. I'm very familiar with the region's media yeah. diminishing. Uh, that's one of my experiences. Um, have you found that your network and the variety of shows you have are filling that gap? Are you pulling the audience from the local news, be it CHCH, uh, your Metroland papers, whatever, into podcasting. So our uh, our approach right now is actually a very cooperative um, one. Um, we are we're focused on building podcasts in areas where there's just no interest uh, from mainstream media in uh, in covering. So um, uh, issues that uh, like we have uh, podcasts that deal with um, feminist issues, indigenous issues. Um, the uh, intersectionality between uh, black racism and indigenous racism, right? So these are all areas that mainstream media doesn't want to touch. Yeah. And I'm not creating the content for these shows. Um, I'm helping uh, the people who, um, uh, who have a stake in those conversations, um, basically providing the technical infrastructure okay. for them to be able to deliver their stories. And, um, and then through like this collective you know, thirty some odd people were were basically building the capacity so that they have they have more and more capacity to tell those stories themselves. That's our approach with it. Local media has been very open and receptive to that because they have no interest in the stories that we're yeah. that we're covering, right? So, um, but in times when there is an interest, 
then they know that they have resources within the community who are focused on those things, and they can they can bring in people who are trusted to speak about those things, right? I see. Okay. And um, and we're doing that in a way that doesn't directly compete with them, yeah. um, even though that we're you know, starting to also uh, offer uh, advertising because we have um, uh, we have uh, almost 5,000 monthly uh, downloads um, through the through the network. So it's at the point now where it's commercially you know. Um, viable from uh, from that standpoint, but Bell Media, um, uh, Torstar, uh, they've all been really supportive in in what we're doing because we don't appear, I and mean, we're not, we don't appear to be eating their lunch. Yeah. Right. And so Torstar doesn't like when that happens. Yeah. And and so we uh, um, the the like um, Niagara this week, which is uh, a series of uh, it's a regional weekly paper put out by Torstar. Um, they uh, they are participants in our weekly uh, oh. news roundup, right? So CKTB has um, most of the hosts from Niagara Podcasters on their roundtable conversations, and they give us promos and plugs and all that sort of stuff. So it's um, we've become part of the ecosystem, and we've done that just by um, being small enough that we don't matter at the moment, but that will change. So, so oh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Evan. I, I'm just wondering where you see the end game of this. Do you see the Niagara Network becoming a network that's going to have this stable of podcasts, or is your goal to have these folks get independent and get into something else? Oh, so um, so our goal is to continue to, to be a network, to develop more shows. Um, any show who's currently on the network can go independent whenever they want. Um, like that's not. Um, that's not ultimately why we're uh, why we're doing it, but in order to do that, they would have to um, they'd have to do their own technical production. They'd have to find their own hosting, right? We take care of all that stuff. We just made it really easy for them to um, to start talking into the mic and then have that appear on the internets, right? So, so this sounds pretty unique. Is there an equivalent of this in Toronto? There, uh, not in Toronto. Um, there are uh, there are networks that are popping up. Uh, all over the place, though. There's one in Peterborough, if I recall correctly. That one, um, who was talking about this recently? Dan Spearin, um was talking about this recently. Um, there's one in, there's a couple out west. Uh, but again, the formats are, are kind of different. We're, uh, some of them are just, let's all promote together, but we're actually doing show development with, uh, with folks. So yeah, it's, um, it's unique, but we're we're learning lots of cool uh, stuff. I will. I, I do want to talk to you about this at some point in the future because we are open sourcing everything that uh, that we do, or Creative Commons as a you know as appropriate. Um, but the the fact of the the fact is, all of the material that we're putting together to run the network um, will be available for anyone else who wants to do the the, the same thing. Um, our goal long term is to have a network like this in every geographic area that wants it, and then have all of those network together as a, um, uh, as a competitor to, well not a competitor, but as an alternative to like new services. To developing and packaging almost a model that could be implemented somewhere else. Yeah, and from a monetization standpoint, we're looking at a traditional service model where, you know, lots of people can't um, figure out, you know, the implementation, and so we, we would assist with that, things like that. So. Um, but it's like starting to put together all those uh, pieces. Having so, yes. That was exactly my question. Actually, is how do you monetize this? Is, are you strictly selling these like the support services for for someone to put together the podcast? So um, there are uh, right now it's all through volunteer effort. Uh, our but our costs outside of that are fairly minimal. We have less than uh, five thousand dollars in equipment. And we have uh, about fifteen dollars a month in like networking costs and things like that. Like it's not we're not talking about huge sums of uh, uh, of money here. Um, in terms of people's time, though, we do want to get it, the more and more dedicated we want to be with this, the more likely we are to have to pay people, right? So right now we're looking at uh, volunteer commitments of. You know, between uh, three and um, uh, three hours a week, and say uh, six hours a week. Um, so we're not talking about a huge amount of time. But if we if we want to grow, we might 
look at that. Um, if you look at our numbers, we're, uh, you know, we're, we can start uh, selling ads and bringing in money that pays some people, you know, like maybe some core people for some of the time. Um, but we also have a bunch of people who are listening to us, who are connecting with us, that we're also exploring things like Patreon and uh, like doing listener support, things like that. Um, but again, it's like there's only so many hours in the week and it takes us, like we're spending most of our time actually producing material right now. So uh, what I want, my personal goal is to get more people in these production type roles so that I can take a step back and focus more at the network level to, to grow those things. Yes? What is the most time consuming? Uh, right now it's edited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So they're like we're doing uh, twelve shows. So there's roughly six hours of um, podcasts a week to um, to to edit. Um, so that's yeah. That takes roughly twelve, sometimes eighteen hours to you know, to do. Or no, uh, six hours in total. We have 12 episodes, but they're usually in the neighborhood of like 20 to 20 minutes to a half hour. So if you look at total episode time, we're at around six hours. And, and so if you if you had a block of time, yep. how would you break out percentage-wise of how much you're doing editing versus all the other all the other things that you're doing? Oh, right now it's a it's easily 50% editing, and then um, uh, and then the rest of my. Uh, volunteer time, which is about 10 hours a week, is uh, is spent on um, show development, like editorial, like editorial meetings, stuff like that. And then once or twice a month, I have a chance to say, all right, what are the things? What are the admin things on the on the list that I can start checking off? So as we teach more people to do the technical parts, though, then I'll have a chance to to, to step back. But uh, we. My approach with this is we operate, it operationalized the, the content production, and now more people are doing that. Now our next step is to operationalize the, um, the, the technical production, and so that's what we're working on next. And then, we work in, uh, then we're working on uh, uh, growing the network, because if we do those two things first, we already have a product that we can sell. So, yes. The location or facility are you using to, to do? Oh, so we have um, we have a partnership with uh, a uh, co-working space in Niagara called Cowork Niagara, and uh, they have a call room um, that uh, like it's for calls and meetings during the day. Uh, at night, it's uh, uh, its superpower is that it becomes our pop-up podcast studio, um, and uh, and we we basically just do all the shows um, out of that. Uh, we split. Um, we split resources to uh, to make the room uh, like recording friendly. So we got some you know uh, uh, egg carton foam and, and stuff like that for the you know for the room. And um, but all of our equipment can tear down if they need it just for a meeting. But what they uh, what they do is they'll use it in the day for recording webinars or doing conference calls or all that sort of stuff. What you find is that the the requirements of both of those types of uses are the same. So. Um, so there was a shared uh, benefit and, and interest in. So you're covered on, in like insurance-wise and things. You're covered under somebody else's policy. Right? Yeah. So um, now we're still a very grassroots, you know, organization. We don't have, um, you know, we don't have like uh, insurance against like if somebody were to, you know, to to issue like a, a libel or, or a slander suit uh, against us. Cease and desist. Yeah. Yeah. We would be we would be in a lot of trouble. So we would cease and desist, and we would just say, I'm very sorry. You know, um, we would eat crow before uh, uh, before we let it become too much of a problem. But what's the startup cost? Like, if someone were to replicate this model in another region, what's the startup cost? At its at its barest, yeah. you would need um, you would need a couple of microphones, um, a basic mixer, right? A computer to um, to record the the audio. So you're uh, assuming you already have a computer. Um, we spent less than four hundred dollars when we first started. So, and then we just added stuff as we went. Any other questions? You mentioned an uh, audience persona, but as your network gets bigger, have you thought about uh, the network persona? Basically, if you have set uh, 
uh, perspectives and uh, ideas, ideologies that uh, you're focusing on, or is it just kind of a uh, free for all? We don't have those yet. We haven't considered them yet. Um, I would say for right now it's a free for we have, uh, because we have people um, on both sides of, of the political spectrum, we have lots of folks in the center as well. Right? Um, it's, uh, it's really more about telling uh, as uh, diverse stories as, uh, as we can. And so those are going to come from all sorts of different perspectives. I was curious about that, um, because I, I do a podcast about um, like food, food and culture, mm -hmm. um, specific to kind of like uh, the Southeast Asian community in Toronto. Okay. Um, and I've been really wanting, I've been starting to kind of reach out to like local bands and stuff to see like if they can like do some intro music, some techno music. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering um, for the Niagara Podcasters Network, what's your, um, do you still get a lot of your music from like from musicarchive.org or some yes. other sources? Or yeah. Are you, have you started to explore kind of partnerships with local musicians? Uh, to kind of do some kind of cross promotion. Uh, we have, and also the um, also the local, uh, like our college, Niagara College, mm -hmm. um, the the university. We're exploring, you know, what we can do in partnership with uh, those organizations. Um, also, just uh, you know, connecting with local folks and you know, bands and stuff, and just saying this is what we're doing. Yeah. Um, we uh, uh, one of the things that we added to the regional our news magazine is we're trying to highlight a local artist, a uh, musician, uh, each time. So just, you know, play a track, do the do the intro to it, um, and as long as they give us permission to, uh, you know, to, to play it, then we'll, you know, we'll put it in a nice package, right, and get it out in front of people. So we're, we're hoping to start to stimulate that kind of conversation by doing that, but in a lot of communities like this, it's very, we want to take the approach of, let's find ways that we can help you first, and then we will, you know, we'll worry about how you can help us later on, right? So, uh, some of them offer upfront, others, you know, it, it takes time to, to, to build that trust. So, again, you use the word permission. A uh, legal document that's being signed by the artist, what exactly is that? And then, so, we just, we, we basically have, uh, we just got them to send us an email indicating that they give us permission to, to use a specific song on a specific podcast. Oh. And where are those emails kept forever more? Um, we're just really, on your computer. No? Yeah, we're you know, in, in, if you look at what our risk is in that situation, um, the worst case scenario is somebody issues a takedown notice, right. right? So it's we're not putting a lot of effort into the um, in, into the legal because that uh, we we tend to culturally we have a habit of not um, doing things until there's a reason to do them. So in, in that case, we're just trying to make sure that they know that we're going to use that um, that work in this work and that they're okay with uh, with us doing that. Um, and that'll satisfy most of the cases where a problem could, you know, could come up. So, any other questions? Um, I'm around the rest of the day, so if you guys want to ask anything about the, the network, you know, going on, I'd be happy to answer questions. So thanks for your time.